the race is on. And what a Grand Prix it was in Hungary with Esteban Ocon and the Alpine brand taking their first F1 victories, first corner chaos and another big swing in the World Championship fight. I'm Ed Straw and joining me to unravel a weekend of surprises, controversy, clashes and exclusions are Scott Mitchell and Mark Hughes. Well, Mark, hello. These days when it all goes upside down and we get a shot winner, they're just great, aren't they? Yeah, and the way it played out was really good as well, wasn't it? Because it was uh, there was all sorts of ways it might have turned out in the end as Hamilton was coming back through. And yeah, yeah, it was it was uh, 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 not just a nice result, uh, but a, a, a thrilling way for it to play out. Yeah, plenty of us to delve into shortly. And I'm also joined by Scott Mitchell. Amazingly, not via a Zoom link to Stockholm, but sat next to me in my Budapest hotel room. Scott, you've brought the excitement with you. Yeah, I, I should have uh, come back sooner, apparently. I, I, I brought the chaos. I felt bad on Saturday. I uh, um, When I was uh, speaking to George Russell afterwards, I almost wanted to apologise because I, I'd ended his run of uh, making it out of Q1. But now it turns out I might be a bad omen for Williams in qualifying, but I'm an excellent omen for them in Grand Prix. And everybody can thank me as well for making this pretty chaotic, spectacular and enjoyable. So you're welcome, everybody. There's a future for Scott Mitchell as Williams team mascot and maybe just a general F1 chaos generator. So uh, if, we ever get, if we ever get you off this podcast, that's where you can go. Well, let's crack into it because there is so much to talk about and we're going to go really conventional with this one and start at the beginning so scott damp track everyone on intermediates and then at turn one we had two independent accidents that set the stage for this amazing race first was valtteri bottas making that error under braking and piling into lando norris which then caught up the two red bulls he got a five place penalty for that deserved yes <laughs> there's really little more to say about it he's he I, I, I have a feeling this was just Valtteri getting a little bit distracted. He was so close behind Norris. And yeah, Norris did sort of cut in front of him, but he had a couple of seconds to react. He didn't get on the brake soon enough or lift off the throttle. Got caught up behind the McLaren's gearbox, locked the rear. It's a very easy thing to do. But to be honest, quite we had Red Bull accusing Hamilton, didn't we, at the British Grand Prix of making an amateur error. This was more of an amateur error. It was just a silly silly mistake to make one that's completely avoidable one with huge consequences so Valtteri had to hold his hands up he did he apologized to the guys whose races he ruined but he can have no uh, objections to a five-place grid penalty for the next race and the consequences of Bottas's mistake Mark Perez was out Norris couldn't take the restart so was effectively out Verstappen was heavily damaged obviously Bottas was also uh, in the wall and gone but then we had that second incident as well with Lance Stroll breaking too late, chucking himself onto the grass to try and avoid an accident. Then he was into Charles Leclerc and Daniel Ricciardo, who at the time were probably thinking, oh, this has all opened up very nicely for us. They could very easily have been second and third uh, on that lap. So what did you make of what happened with Stroll? Yeah, Ocon, you saw just before that, Ocon was getting a run on Leclerc, but seemed to realise it was getting too marginal. And instead of going down for the inside of the Ferrari, he flicked left and just, you know, obviously decided to, he thought better of uh, making a move and then obviously decided to concentrate on the exit. And as he did that, Stroll moved the other way and he moved into that gap that um, Ocon had just declined and it was um, it was too late by then. And he did a, you know, very similar lockup to Valtteri, he just locked the rears, desperately tried to avoid Leclerc by getting onto the grass but that just sort of made the accident slightly different and uh yeah he just hit the side of the ferrari and ripped up all the, the radiators open on the, on the ferrari so that put leclerc out as well and so that the first accident the bottas accident worked beautifully for ocon and vettel and the second accident worked beautifully for those who'd started near the back so you you then had um uh, Sainz, who'd started 15th, was suddenly 4th, followed by Sonoda, who'd started 16th, followed by Latifi, who'd started 17th. So that that put that little group in place, and that was quite significant for what happened later on. Yeah, it's certainly uh, a pretty spectacular way to start the race. Obviously, big implications for the championship as well, with Verstappen uh, in, in the wars. I mean, Scott, do you think the conditions are any excuse? Obviously, it probably wouldn't have happened in dry conditions, but I know Daniel Ricciardo, after the race, I was asking him about the stroll incident. He sort of said, well, 
you know, yeah, it is easy in those conditions, but it's the kind of start where you don't really gain from being late on the brakes. It's more one where you pick your spot. So I think he clearly felt that that was the sort of incident that, that drivers at this level shouldn't be having. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that interpretation entirely. And, and Norris said afterwards that you do expect a bit more when you're racing drivers at, at this level. Maybe Bottas, this was Norris's position, maybe Bottas has a little bit to learn still and with, with pack racing because obviously he hasn't had to go into too many first corners at starts in the dirty area of other cars. So maybe that played a part in it. But um, I, 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 I just think... Bottas got, I think Bottas got distracted so close in behind the McLaren, and I suspect, like, just lost where he was on the run down to turn one. Maybe thought turn one was a bit further away, but it's basically as soon as he hits the brakes, it's it's game over there, and that's the bit that's easy to do. As soon as you snatch those rears, you you're a passenger. But yeah, in a, in a race in a race as long as that, what's the Hungarian Grand Prix, seventy one laps or or whatever it is. So, and in those conditions. You don't want to be the one getting caught up in something at turn one, let alone the one causing it. So yeah, the conditions obviously play a part in it, but that's where Bottas, as a driver of such experience, should know don't do not do exactly what he then went on to do. Yeah, Bottas in particular certainly had time to make that a lot easier uh, for himself. Now, as usual, we do have some questions submitted by members of the Races Members Club, and thanks very much to all of you for your support. Paul Samnacker... And I should urge you, if if anybody from the Members Club finds me mispronouncing their names, do email us and I'll correct it in future episodes. But Paul asks, if Bottas' incident and the penalty will make Toto Wolff's decision whether to drop Valtteri Bottas for George Russell easier, what do you think, Mark? Does it make any difference? Um, I suspect the decision has already been made. And um, no, I don't think this will have uh, any, any influence on it at all. You could say it was a heroic effort, just take out Hamilton's championship rival. Help lay the foundations for Mercedes getting the lead in both championships. Job done. But I would say it was no way deliberate. It was just uh, it, it was it was a blunder rather than anything sinister. Now we also have a question from Mike Meredith, who actually asked a similar question on Bottas. But he also asked whether Esteban Ocon's victory will put him back in Mercedes contention. And well, while Ocon does have Mercedes links, he is firmly under lock and key at Alpine with that new three-year deal that should keep him at the team from 2022 to 2024. So for next year, that's definitely closed off. And Russell is firmly their favoured alternative to Bottas. And we may get some news on that over the summer break. So we've got a situation where four cars are out of the race. Under the stoppage, Lando Norris's McLaren can't be repaired. So that's 15 cars left so let's move to the, to the what we're going to call a second formation lap uh, which actually technically is a is a race lap mark so thanks to the chaos that led for the second start Hamilton on pole ahead of Ocon, Vettel, Sainz, Sonoda, Latifi, Alonso, Russell, Raikkonen and Schumacher with Alonso, with Verstappen down in 13th place but then everyone except Hamilton piled into the pits now Tamara Salter asks whose decision it was for Lewis not to pit at the end of the formation lap his or the teams so can you just talk through the process that led to this bizarre sight of a, of a one car start yeah there's um there's a little bit of ambiguity here because it's not strictly a formation lap because on a formation lap um, you remember the the Haas drivers got done for this last year. You can't um, instruct the driver um, in, in. You can't coach the driver, and, and telling the driver uh, to box uh, would run you foul of that if it was a formation lap. There's a bit of amb- ambiguity about whether that rule still applies when it's it's a formation lap in that it's a, a lap to the grid but it's actually a continuation of the race it's so it, and it it's it's being led by the the safety car um which which th- th- this was so most people seem to be playing it as though it was a formation lap and in which case the driver has to make the call on the radio you will absolutely inevitably have been a discussion between the driver and the team beforehand about about this very point and it will have been you know if you if you decide that it's dry enough for slicks you 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 will have to tell us um so the there was a couple of drivers that were seemed to be waiting um for instructions uh carlos Sainz was one uh nicholas latifi was another and then it was uh it was 
but sort of Latifi's engineer said, uh, I, I can't talk to you about that, uh, remember? And Latifi said, yeah, yeah, copy. I want to come in. So there did seem to be a little bit of uh, variation between the teams and how they were handling this. And as far as Lewis was concerned, he was telling the team, turn one's dry, turn two's dry, turn three's dry, turn four's dry. But he wasn't actually saying, I'm coming in. And nor were the team issuing any instructions to him. But they are adamant that they wanted them to stay out anyway, and there wasn't just a breakdown of communication. Um, the the reasons that they give for that um, we'll, we'll come to later, um, but it is basically when you're in the lead, you, you you're the one that makes the call, the the the, the first call, and everybody else sort of it, it has a, an easier decision once they've seen what you've done. So there was an element of that as well. But in whose call call it was. I think technically it's the drivers, um, but I think the team had already decided how it wanted to play this. And so there will have been discussions between driver and team beforehand. There's obviously the question of how much ground would have been lost in the pit line, given the Mercedes pit box is at, is at the end. But it probably would have been better just to, just to take that hit, uh, given the uh, given the time loss involved. But Scott, there was an interesting question because both David Shankle and Michael Passingham asked similar questions, which was what would have happened if all 15 cars had pitted at the end of the second formation lap? So there wouldn't have been any cars on the grid. Yep. Um, so this was one of the main curiosities um, of the uh, of that restart because one, one car taking the start is obviously unprecedented. So it's already interesting enough, but it's impossible not to look at that and think, it's so easy for that to have been a case where they all came in. It just took. It would have just taken Mercedes to view it slightly different differently. So, so basically, there's there's no specific detail in the sporting regulations for for this scenario, um, because it's not the sort of thing that anyone really, really could have seen foreseen playing out. But uh, race director Michael Massey's revealed that the full normal start process would have been followed. So, so we'd have had. A full start procedure, including the five red lights, even if there was no car on the grid to take those red lights. Uh, so essentially what would have happened, uh, the final car coming into the pit lane would have been the equivalent of the final car taking its position on the starting grid. So when that car entered the pit lane, the start signal would have been initiated, five red lights would have come on, and then fo- and then the five red lights would have gone out. And once that happened, the green light at the pit exit would have been shown. And obviously that... Now, uh, in reality, that happened when Hamilton passed the pit exit. But the green light would come on at the end of the pit lane as soon as those five right, five red lights go out. And then the field go go back out. They return to the track in the order that they line up um, at, at, at the exit. So actually, logical, quite straightforward. It's the sort of thing that I was thinking um, when I was... Uh, when, when I was uh, thinking about it and, and, and when I learned what the actual procedure would have been... When you actually picture it, just the idea of going through that start and having the five red lights go on, that is just such a that's such a bizarre that that would just be something that I don't think I could ever get over seeing that sight. So I'm kind of gutted in a way. We did see something quite spectacular in its own way today, but I am kind of gutted we didn't get the really, really unusual version. It would have been a case of lights out and away they don't go, I guess, at the start of the race. But it would have been interesting to watch every... Well, they're all scrambling at the pit exit uh, anyway. But yeah, surreal situation for, for for Lewis Hamilton. But in the grand scheme of things, I guess we do have to put that down as an error for Mercedes, don't we? That they, they should have brought him in because he'd have been in... He'd have lost less time doing that. And despite the congestion of the pit lane, it would have been the, the logical thing to do, I guess, wouldn't it, Mark? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the... The thinking, just to just to be clear, is that when you're the first, when you're the first um, garage in the pit lane, and it's it's a everybody's piling in, you will have to wait for an age before you can rejoin because you're having to wait for the traffic to come past. Whereas if you're down the bottom end of the pit lane, like Williams, you 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 know you don't have as much traffic coming past you before you can. Rejoin, so you got a better chance of making up places the further further down the pit lane you are, and they they figured that if they had um, 
come in and come in at the end of that. Well, they figured two things. They figured that teams, not everybody would come in and that teams would probably split between the two cars, between that, that lap and the next lap. And they also figured that um, they would lose six or seven places, something like that, because of where they were, where their garage was uh, positioned. As it turned out, the way it worked is that they, you know, they rejoined last, so it was it was far worse than uh, the worst case scenario that they'd they'd figured by if they'd come in on that lap. So yes, absolutely, it was an error in hindsight. Um, you can see what the logic of the thinking was, but the track was just way too dry for that to work, and the the, the first laps of the slick shod cars were just so much faster than um, than, you know, than it would have been necessary to allow that uh, to. To work, and by the time the last car had gone by, it was only thirteen seconds behind Lewis as he came in. So the stop takes twenty seconds. So he was uh, seven seconds behind last. There was also some fun for George Russell Scott in that that pit stop sequence. In that, obviously, Williams down the far end of the pit lane, he crawled out of his pit box. There were a bunch of cars there, and then he had a quick discussion about can he go, and then he decided to go around them just as he was being told. No, so George Russell did actually lead until uh, kind of just the run, the short run between turn, the exit of turn seven and turn and into turn eight, I think. Well, he had the net lead. Obviously, Hamilton was still in the lead uh, uh, up ahead. But the, speaking to Russell after this, he had he had like the a really she, sheepish grin on his face as he explained it because he was just sort of saying that well, came out of the pit box, the cars were there, and I thought. I can do it in other sessions and it's right there. And if I'm allowed to do it, I'm going to, I'm going to be leading. So I'm just going to do it. But he sort of, he didn't quite fully commit to it because yeah, he did the little radio message and it's just really funny. If if anyone's got um, F1 TV access, it's well worth digging this out to watch it back on Russell's onboard because the, the audio is slightly out of sync. Um, but basically, it creates a situation where just as uh, Ru- Russell sort of radios the team to say, um, like, basically, can I go to the front of the queue? And he basically makes up his own mind. And just as he goes and darts to the front of the queue, he just gets a negative <laughs> back over the radio. But he's already done it. So <laughs> by this point, uh, George said by this point, he knew he'd already he'd already got it wrong. But then Williams basically sorted it out over the radio with um, with Michael Massey and said that they were going to self-punish basically drop George back behind uh, Fernando Alonso where he should have been in the queue. Um, and actually, I think George ha- George and Williams thereafter, I think they handled that really well, being able to just sort of drop back relatively efficiently, not cause themselves too many problems. So uh, it was uh, it was opportunistic. George reckons any driver would have done it in his situation. I suspect he's probably right. But uh, yeah, it, it was never really likely to come off. It's amazing that basically... We've talked about here, there's really been almost no racing, but we've been talking for 15, 20 minutes already because there's been so much going on to set up these mad situations in the race. Absolutely uh, astonishing. But yeah, once Hamilton came in, obviously he dropped to the back. So uh, yeah, that set the foundations for the race. Well, Mark, once we got through all the madness of the, the two starts, we had Ocon leading from Vettel and Latifi, Damage Verstappen down in 11th, Hamilton 14th and last. And from that point, it was kind of a race conducted in two parts, wasn't it? With Ocon versus Vettel battling up front. But the big question mark was whether Hamilton could get involved and how that chase would work out. That was what this race was all about, really, wasn't it? Yeah, and it didn't look too promising at first for Hamilton because he couldn't make any inroads on the the back of the pack. He was just, you know, every time he got close, he was... you know, in the turbulent air, and then his brakes were getting too hot. It took him eleven laps just to get by uh, last last place. But um, they they pitted him early, which got him the idea being get him some free air and fresh tires, and to get him a, a a tire offset that would allow him to overtake. And they did that in the knowledge that they were always going to two stop. So they but they didn't want to telegraph that too early. So uh, you, you later had the. Um, 
the, the teams that he was racing against, unsure whether he was going to stop again or not. And this is what science was onto it quite early. He was telling he was telling Ferrari, keep an eye on what Hamilton's doing because he's going to be he's he's going to be the challenge. They he might stop again. Um, so yeah, this how how he made up those places um, with a two stop strategy was uh, versus the one stop of, effectively one stop of everybody else um, was, was how the that. that that came to a, a bit of a crescendo at the end, and um, he, he was he was delayed in his uh, ride through the pack, of course, by Fernando Alonso, who was defending like a demon his fourth place. And the time that that cost Lewis effectively uh, ensured he didn't win the race because um, when he eventually did get by Alonso and he got past Sainz pretty quickly after that. He was right on the tail of Vettel within a lap, so he had enough of a pace uh, advantage over the um, Alpine and the Aston that uh, I think with uh, two or three more laps, uh, he the, the the laps that he was cost by Alonso, I think um, he would have won it. It's very Fernando Alonso, isn't it? Because he was delayed at the start. He went to the outside line in the first corner, got delayed a little bit by the first accident, and the second clash really kind of cost him and, and meant he wasn't up there with, with Ocon. But it ended up being that Ocon took the Alpine win, but Alonso was still absolutely key to it. I quite often look at the uh, the, the race traces. So you can compare drivers' races. And if you compare Hamilton to Ocon, you can sort of see that the progress. And there's this, this 10, 11 lap flat line where Alonso is just doing his, nope, I'm just not letting you through. And it was so, so critical. In fact, the whole race, Alonso was in a handy place because he was sat in Vettel's pit window forever as well, just as a little bit of insurance. And uh, I think it's very important not to underestimate the role that Fernando Alonso uh, played in that, as well as getting a very, very good result in in his own right. He absolutely, I'm not going to say play the team game because doing that served his own race as well, but you could see the way he was battling with Hamilton. Whenever Those couple of times Hamilton had a look around the outside of turn two and just had to back out of it. Alonso would absolutely have shown him the grass legally and Hamilton knew it. So it was just great to have those uh, those moments. But there was that brief moment into turn four, wasn't it, when Hamilton got a little bit uh, stressed, shall we say, Scott? Yeah, he wasn't happy. He felt that, uh, well, ironically, given what had happened a couple of weeks ago, he felt that Alonso had made a dangerous move at high speed. Um, and uh, yeah, so Hamilton complained about it and then post-race he referenced it again and said, is anything being done about that dangerous driving? But then he quite quickly after that, also like literally a few seconds later, said, "I basically said oh, it doesn't matter now; it, it's done." And then when he reflected on the battle post race, he did say it was. He said it was amazing. He said it was a great fight. He said Alon- he did feel that Alonso did go over the limit slightly, and I, I, I sort of see his point because up to turn four, I mean, ultimately the the, the rule is you have to leave a car's whip space. You could you could see. There was a tiny bit of, of of rubbing. If you looked at the, 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 so it would have been the front left wheel of Hamilton's car, the front left tire, the Pirelli marking on the outside was slightly scuffed and uh, a bit darker, so you could see that it had a hit. And he did end up, I think both of his right wheels on the run up to turn four, just before the entry, I think they went up on the curb on the right hand side, which is beyond the white line. So if you want to get really pedantic about it, Alonso didn't leave a car's width to to, to the white line, but I think, as we've said so many times on this podcast, if you're going to try and throw it around the outside of someone, you, you've got to be willing to accept that that can go a little bit wrong. Alonso has maybe strayed like a, a centimetre too far to the right um, in in holding Hamilton on, on the outside. But the, that, he's never making that move anyway. Alonso doesn't do anything. It's not like when Leclerc moved over on Hamilton at Monza in, in 2019 and properly bumped Hamilton off the track. It was just a light wheel rub. Hamilton got away with it. I think, you know, get over it. it it's hard racing. Alonso didn't put a wheel wrong the rest of the time. It was just hard, aggressive racing. Alonso, just the kind of guy whose race craft is just absolutely phenomenal. And I will save this point in full, maybe for a summer break podcast that we do, because it might come up again. But this race reiterated why I completely hold my hands up and admit I was totally wrong about Fernando Alonso. I'm not going to say I thought he was overrated, but by the time I came into F1 properly, it was 2018. Alonso, not really sort of, 
having a few races where he shows his virtu- you know the sort of virtuoso performances we've come to expect from him but the mclaren was was just a bad car um he went away did his own thing i wasn't that excited about him coming back because it was kind of like you know an older driver coming back that hasn't worked out in the past alpine or renault as it was a, a nowhere team not really expecting that much of him first couple of races kind of reinforced that so i just didn't really get that excited about the comeback and now the last few races i've just been watching him more and more closely following him on boards watching back his races i'm a complete convert now I, I i i do just totally get it having actually finally watched him properly up close is just it is it's just it's a master craftsman at work and that race craft today i thought was just a fantastic example of it oh, it's wonderful he did a fantastic job i mean i would say my ultimately Alonso was the guy that made sure Ocon could win that race. Yes, Ocon had to cover Vettel and do all the rest of it, but Alonso was the roadblock. And and I'm not sure how many drivers could have pulled off what Alonso did in that situation. It's absolutely stunning. And even though it wasn't Alonso who got the win, he absolutely gave his his employers their money's worth there, didn't he? Yeah, absolutely. And he said, you know, he was asked, were you told by the team what the situation was? And he said, no, no. He said, I could see it on the big screen. He said, I could see... That they, you know, Esteban was um, fighting with Seb and Lewis was catching it two seconds per lap, and I worked out that at that rate, if he if I just let him by, he was gonna he was gonna be up with Est- Esteban before very much longer. So I understood the situation. So he, he's worked all that out himself. Um, yeah, absolutely um, brilliant performance. Uh, the only difference between Ocon and Ocon's win and um, Alonso's uh, fifth place in the end. Fourth place once Vettel was uh, uh, excluded. Yeah, yes. So the only difference between the Ocon's win and Al- Alonso's fourth place post Vettel disqualification was where they happened to be placed when the carnage unfolded on the first lap, and that was just random luck. In terms of um, performance, it could absolutely have been Al- Alonso that did that did the Ocon performance. So he's you know he's he's absolutely right there. He's um, his qualifying is, uh, you can rely on now. It's it's all, it's all there. You know, there was a few races earlier in the season where he wasn't quite squeezing the last couple of tenths out of it, but that's that's what seems to be there now. And so I'd say he's driving at our very near peak vintage Alonso now. Yeah, and it's absolutely brilliant to see that happening. And of course, Ocon did play a very, very big role, obviously, under a lot of pressure from Vettel throughout did the job during the the pit stop phase, had a decent in lap, which was important. And then that moment where they happened upon the Alfa Romeo, I think it was Kimi Raikkonen, wasn't it? He just pitted. They got close, but Vettel couldn't quite get ahead. So Ocon absolutely kept his head, even though he always, he never looked like he had the ability to sort of charge off into the distance, or obviously he would have done. So just, just great for Ocon. But Scott, looking at the Ocon story, it, it was a heartwarming win, wasn't it? He came from a relatively ordinary background. He got support because of how good he was. One European F3, GP3 on his way to F1. Had Mercedes support, of course. Then that setback of losing the drive with Aston Martin, then called Racing Point. His struggles when he joined Renault last year. And even that run of races before Silverstone, when he had problems thanks to a front suspension issue. He's fought hard for this, hasn't he? Yeah, every step of the way. Uh, it goes back so, so far. He, his is... Uh... His is such a good story because he's one of the few modern drivers who I don't think you would necessarily call it rags to riches, but he is the sort that it's a it's a it's a pretty normal background really uh, that he comes from, and he's had success on the way. He's it's things like you know a guy who gets shunted across to the DTM, uh, and how many good quality junior single seater drivers have ended up in the DTM with a Mercedes program or something like that and never seen a single seater again but he then got into F1 with the worst team on the grid what the worst car on the grid he's you know losing his drive for non-sporting reasons coming back I mean to put it bluntly got pasted by Ricardo the first half season at least uh, at Renault unusual circumstances obviously to have to get back in the groove but he plugged away. He he really needed that podium last year in another topsy turvy race to secure Grand Prix. I think that just sort of gave him a sort of tangible result that he felt, okay, I know that this is in a fortunate circumstances, but I feel like I've really improved 
in the last few events and and this is not a nice trophy literally to to have to show for it and he just came out the block so well this year and he was fair he, he was just <clears throat> he he looked like he'd taken a step as a driver and obviously had that little dip in form so this is another sort of confidence booster in that sense he's just a guy who knows how to graft and I think the reaction that he got from various drivers even Lewis Hamilton who said you know I think he called him like a a shining star said that this was overdue shows speaks volumes for the quality of the guy and the job he's doing it's very telling that a lot of people were happy for Ocon. A lot of his contemporaries were happy for him. His is a story that I think a lot of people buy into. And when you have an unexpected winner, almost by definition, you like it. And they're probably, a, they're not always, but they're quite a likeable driver. You're happy for them as an individual, not just happy for the storyline they've provided. I think Ocon is really high on the list for sort of, you look at that guy on top of the podium and you smile and go, actually, yeah, that's just brilliant. I can't fault this in the slightest. Fair play to you. Yeah, it's it's a wonderful story, well deserved, and just just a, a great moment. And in fact, after the race, uh, again when I was speaking to Daniel Ricardo, he just he just said, you know, when it's a race like this, I was pleased. It, not that it specifically wasn't Hamilton, but he was pleased it wasn't one of the usual suspects who won. Because when you have a chaos race, it's always a little bit disappointing when someone comes through of the usual of the usual ones to to win. So it's it's great that that Ocon took that chance and he seized it so so well. But Mark, we should also talk about the value for Alpine. Obviously, this is a team that's struggled a little bit. The first few years after Renault bought what had been Lotus went quite well. They they climbed up the ranks, got up to fourth in the constructors' championship quite well. And then they just sort of been bouncing off this ceiling at the, at the top of the midfield, and they were they have been a step behind the Ferrari McLaren battle this year. But this is just going to be such a huge moment. It wasn't a win on merit, yes. A lot of things had to come together for it to happen, but great for that bunch of people, both at Enstone and Viri, to have that success, just to kind of keep them going as they they, they try to break through as a as a as a genuine race winning team on merit. Yeah, just a nice little taste to uh, to motivate them to, you know, get get to feel what it what it's like. Um, and some of them will have been there when when they were doing it on merit, and then it'll be nice to sort of revisit those times and just give them that belief that it's 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 possible. You know, on this day it was um, perhaps fortunate, and but it's 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 it is it is possible, and that's that's just going to be you know, a nice little. Uh, a nice little booster for them. Um, it 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 does all still hang on the you know, the twenty two cars and and where where everybody stacks up in the pile under the new regulations. And really, this is this is just a a nice little a nice little bonus for them because realistically they're they're around about just behind McLaren, Ferrari, Alpha Tauri. You know, the, the the head of that midfield group they're not they're not really contenders this year but you know they've they've pulled the result out of the bag and they pounced upon that opportunity opportunity perfectly and they've got you know two drivers that are really performing now and that's very motivating as well and it, it all seems to be going very well and also what was nice to hear Ocon talking about what a fantastic teammate Alonso is and that he'd been told all sorts of stories about what to expect and it wasn't it didn't sound very good. And he said they've, they've turned out to be totally wrong. He says he's he's just been fantastic. Yeah, and as we said, absolutely crucial to to the victory. But it's great for that team. And obviously, this is a team that's been through a lot over the years. And it's funny, isn't it? It very much like no team. It kind of comes and fades and comes and fades, doesn't it? Uh, you know, the first win was back in in Mexico in 1986 with Gerhard Berger, and they've had a few periods of being a championship winning force. But the last win was what Melbourne 2013 with uh, with Kimi Räikkönen. So there've been some tough times since then. So just great for everyone there. But. We should, Mark, talk about Vettel and Aston Martin. Originally, I was going to ask you whether Vettel should have been delighted with second or disappointed that he couldn't quite grab the lead. But several hours after the race, we did have news of his disqualification. This was about a fuel sample. So can you please explain exactly what happened there? Uh, they, it's, it's, well, you, you probably saw that he stopped on the um, on the slowdown lap. Um, you have to be able to give 
uh, a, a certain quantity of, of fuel as, as a sample at the end of the race. And so they wanted to ensure that they had enough uh, still in the in the tank to to be able to give that sample. That's how close to the the limit they were, and and how much they the, the, you know, the word they were pushing for that um, victory in the last few laps. And then when it came time to uh, take the sample from their car, they they could they couldn't give enough. It has to be uh, how many liters? One liter. Yeah, one liter for the sample. Yeah, it has to be one liter, and they got point four of a liter out of it, and that's that's just you know it's it's black or white. It's it's either you get enough out or you don't, and they they couldn't. So um, they're adamant that it the 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 fuel is in there, but um, if they can't produce it and they can't give the sample, then it uh, it's an automatic disqualification. So yeah, we've. <laughs> You've got two different results. You can either consider it to be Ocon Vettel Hamilton Sainz Alonso or Ocon Hamilton Sainz Alonso uh, at the top. One thing I just wanted to add on the on the fuel rules is obviously Aston Martin have said they've got the the necessary fuel for that sample, but there is a technical regulation six point six point four which states that the sampling procedure must not necessitate starting the engine or the removal of bodywork other than the nose box assembly and the cover over any refueling connector. Now, this is important because you can say all you want that there's X amount of fuel in it, but if you can't get it out in the conventional way without removing bodywork, then you're in trouble. Normally, what happens in this situation is, is the FIA try and take the sample the normal way. If they can't, they'll the team will say, well, it's in there, and they'll say, okay, well, you get it out conventionally while we supervise you, which apparently they wouldn't have been able to do, I'm assuming by the fact that the exclusion went through. So it's going to be interesting to see how that goes. Very, very difficult to get this overturned, I'd imagine. But uh, let's see what happens. But that, that regulation is important because it's not just about how much fuel is in there. It's about what you have to do to get it out that is uh, is significant. Let's quickly talk, Scott, about the championship fight. Max Verstappen had significant damage to his car in that situation. Picking up a point for 10th place represented a really good result. Hamilton finished third, but denied the fastest lap point by Alpha Tauri driver Pierre Gasly, who did his Red Bull duty and grabbed that uh, fastest lap with a late pit stop. I'm not going to say exactly how many points to swing that is in, in favour because uh, because of the problems with uh, with Vettel in the, re- the results. So, J.A. van der Waal from our members club says, who is the winner from Hungary, Hamilton or Verstappen? Well, ultimately, it is Hamilton. He's the bigger winner because he's taken the lead of the championship. And they've both dropped points and they're both going to be disappointed that they haven't come away with more points. Um, I think Hamilton will be very happy to to come away with the championship lead and whatever it is, whether it's a second or third place finish, uh, because of where he was at one stage where it did look like just the the uh, peculiarities or the uh, difficulties of the Hungaro ring were really stymieing his charge. Um, but ultimately, he has he has salvaged the podium from it. He did say after the race it should have been an easy win, um, and he's right, but so be it. The main thing is that uh, while he is disappointed not to have really rammed home that, uh, that situation with Verstappen having the problem and, and, and only scraping into the top 10... Ultimately, he has extended the championship lead by probably it'll end up being um, more than he would have done if he'd won and uh, Verstappen had been th- third or second. So it's a prob. To be honest, it's a bigger it's a bigger gain than he'd have expected going into Sunday. Uh, but Verstappen will be pretty happy to have salvaged one, maybe two points from this Grand Prix, considering he was driving a car that Christian Horner claimed had less downforce than a Haas. Which is um, an interesting uh, an interesting way of characterising. I feel sorry for Haas that that's the uh, frame of reference that they that that, that that they offer now. Um, it, it's a it's a situation where either driver could you know try to find a silver lining, but obviously Verstappen's working with a much bigger cloud than than Hamilton is. Yeah, I think Verstappen actually should be really happy with that point. I think he drove really well to get that. When you consider how frustrated as well he must have been to have uh, have had a, a McLaren flung into him by uh, by Bottas and the amount of damage he had, 
Uh, pretty amazing work by Bottas to manage to take out both the <laughs> both the Red Bull drivers. Just there's always going to be something like this uh, this happening. I should say I said Verstappen was tenth, but he's either ninth or tenth, depending on which version of the results we uh, we believe in. Yeah, depending on whether you buy into Schrodinger's Seb or not. Um, the other thing that uh, uh, on on that outcome is Toto Wolf did say after the race that maybe given what Bottas did at Turn One, maybe is a bit of karma that Lewis didn't come away with full points because. I'm sure that, uh, well, we we know that Red Bull won't take that as much consolation and I'm sure there are already plenty of conspiracy theorists telling me on Twitter that actually this was entirely intentional and Bottas did this on purpose to ruin Verstappen's race so that Mercedes could harpoon the lead Red Bull for the second Grand Prix in a row. But in, in, in reality, it was unfortunate, but I can see why Mercedes probably would have felt that a maximum score after one of their cars skittles both Red Bulls would have been particularly awkward. So maybe this was a maybe this was a neater middle ground where Hamilton still gets something out of it because he did nothing wrong today. Uh, but Mercedes don't quite, you know, rub salt into the wound that Bottas hacked open. And Mark, J.A. van der Waal also asked about the relative performance of Mercedes and Red Bull in terms of the hungry pace and also in light of the recent update at Silverstone, and what that means for the rest of the season. Mike Meredith asks as well if this shows Mercedes has caught up with Red Bull, or is it difficult to tell given the way the the race unfolded and the the limited sample set of, of, I guess, if we're considering this in Silverstone to be the the relevant data? I think you can't... um judge the potential of the Red Bull on its performance this weekend, even, even forget forget today, but just looking at yesterday they, or the Friday and Saturday, Red Bull was in all sorts of bother trying to get that car balanced on the, the track temperatures that we had. They even had to revert to um, a, a smaller rear wing um, because they just could not get enough front end on it. They, they, they had full front flap on it and it was still under steering madly um on on the soft tire and so they had to revert they had to surrender total downforce on a downforce track which tells you that how desperate they were just to just to get a balance and when they put the smaller wing on they they were still on full front flap so that tells you that they were in deep trouble so the combination of surrendering downforce on a downforce rewarding track and still not having a balance that's going to cost you way more lap time than any update's going to bring you. If that update was a really good update that Mercedes brought to Silverstone, it might be worth two tenths, and that would be considered a very useful update. The combined deficit that Red Bull was suffering through the Hungry Weekend, through not being able to get that car in the sweet spot, was way more than two tenths. So we're still not seeing, we're not seeing like, um, comparing like with like. And I think it's going to take a few races before we can assess how much closer or the, the, the update has brought the Mercedes or, or whether it's put it ahead. I don't think we can tell yet. It was no question the Mercedes was by far the quickest car this weekend at that track. But you, you, you weren't seeing a Red Bull in the sweet spot. You, weren't, you were comparing a Merck in its sweet spot with a Red Bull that was way out of its sweet spot. And that's the first time we've seen that this year. But it's brilliant, isn't it? Change of championship leadership. On the brink of the summer break, lots of uncertainty and questions to be answered. This championship battle is going to run and run, which is the main thing we want to see. Scott, finally on this topic, Simon T asks what the lasting damage is to Red Bull, both championship-wise and financially, given the crash at Silverstone and the Hungaroring and the financial hit, given the cost cap rules. The championship hit is quite complicated to answer, given the uh, the Bell situation, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. They, uh, they've they either... They've, they've they've either lost a few points to Merck or they've lost a few points and a little bit more to Merck. Um, I think the I think the real setback is they'll be they'll be really disappointed to go into the summer break behind, given where they were a couple of events ago. Um, but I think the 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 financial hit is something that is obviously more quantifiable for them. They've made a big fuss over the cost within this budget cap environment over the last couple of weeks and and rightly so when it's a when when you have a a massive amount of damage picked up and it's not your fault then i i I totally understand why why that stings this one's going to be even more painful because obviously red bull felt that they were totally blameless at silverstone but the stewards said that hamilton was only predominantly to blame for that clash there was no question about it here and in the stewards' dock. 
Bottas is fully to blame. So with this one, there's literally nothing at all that anyone could argue a Red Bull did wrong. And both of them got absolutely Bottas'd and picked up a load of damage. So it's it's another setback shortly after a an already big setback. I'm I suspect the uh I suspect the damage won't run maybe quite as high as the near to two million dollars that Red Bull was citing after the British Grand Prix. But there's also a, a sporting hit that isn't on the championship side points wise, which is that this is they're gonna have this is gonna have ramifications later in the year because in one weekend both Red Bulls have basically ended up in a position where they're almost certainly going to have a grid penalty later in the year. It, it seems like uh, they, they Honda found a crack in uh, Verstappen's power unit after qualifying, which they're I bas- basically 100% sure is a legacy, an unexpected legacy of the crash from Silverstone. So he's now on his he was on his third PU for the race, and while they're hopeful that they can repair the PU that came out after qualifying. They were only talking about reusing it in practice for later in the year. And I don't think, even with a new PU now and the PU that did the first five or six events of the season, I don't think even if you're using the second PU for practices, I don't think you can get to the end of the season on that. If you do, you're going to have a really high mileage pair of PUs. I've said PU way too much. Um, So I think they're going to need a new one uh, for Max. And then in the race, the damage suffered by Perez with his... Uh, colossal hit <laughs> I think it's fair to say um, that Red Bull are pretty sh- p- seem pretty confident that or pretty convinced that that's done terminal damage to his power unit so, so that means Checo is probably going to need a new one for the Belgian Grand Prix and again with that the, with this one out of the pool most likely that means a, another group penalty to get to the end of the season so there is going to come a point later in the year where I would imagine they'll split them so they don't have misery in the same Grand Prix but that's bad because that means two different races where both where, where a Red Bull is not going to be in the picture and for Verstappen given how tight it looks like it's going to continue to be at the front starting a race down in 20th could be the difference between winning the championship or not you, you never know it could be that close yeah it's a big blow for Red Bull and Verstappen's uh, championship campaign hugely hugely unlucky you know, you, you, although we were we were fairly critical of Red Bull and their their behavior over the review in that the podcast we recorded a few days ago after after that review failed they have been really uh, unlucky and th- this is a you know, Verstappen absolutely did not deserve what happened to him and, and Red Bull the first corner yeah they didn't deserve what happened to them there either so whatever happens we're not going to be completely sure how this will fit into the overall championship picture until it's all finished but I suspect this weekend is one of the ones we're going to talk about at the end of the year when it comes to how the championship was won one way or the other. One driver we've only really mentioned in passing Mark is Carlos Sainz shunted in Q2 so it wasn't looking that promising but he came away with what we're going to call fourth place on the road. Let's call it that. Uh, it, that that counts with uh, with Vettel's uh, results. So if Vettel's excluded. That would be a third place for science, but fourth on the road. Good recovery from him. Ultimately, it was helped by what happened at the first corner. But he was looking really good before that crash, wasn't he? Yeah, it could have been even better as well. He was jumped in the pits by Sonoda and Latifi for the reasons that we discussed earlier, where the position of the garages are. Um, had he had that not happened, he'd have been right there behind Ocon and Vettel with what I suspect was a significantly faster car. Um, I think he would have been um, very much in contention for the win. But by the time uh, they he had to wait in that queue that Latifi was uh, holding up, uh, he was too far behind, really. And he, he did make a lot of that time back up, and Alonso followed him through as well. Um, but it's uh, it was it was too, he lost sort of seven or eight seconds I think um, by the time but they, Latifi and Sonoda got out of his way, so yeah I think um, a, a, a bit of a not a lost opportunity but it, it, they didn't maximize the chances and he just yeah he he got caught out by that gust of wind uh, which left him fifteenth on the grid but uh, arguably that turned out to be a good a good place to start from and it was just uh, the was the fact that he got jumped in the uh, in the pit lane on that um, switch to the slicks that uh, cost him a better result, I think. 
but ultimately still valuable points banks for Ferrari in their battle with with McLaren with McLaren ultimately blanking this weekend owing to what happened at the first corner Scott we also had various post-race investigations there was a procedural error by Esteban Ocon some kind of Sebastian Vettel pre-race t-shirt mishap so can you just explain what that was all about Uh, I can sort of I can't quite explain Ocon's because uh, beyond pointing out that he somehow managed to come around not come back into the pit that he just he, and he stopped <laughs> he, 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 he stopped out on track uh and I don't really know why because I didn't see him be asked about it afterwards maybe he was and I and I just missed it but the other stuff yeah um obviously v- Vettel wasn't the only one uh but Vettel was the most prominent because Vettel was wearing the the t-shirt with the the message uh same love on the front and in the colours of the the pride flag, uh, it was because he'd spoken out obviously earlier in in, in the week against uh, mooted le- legislation in, in Hungary, and Vettel wanted to show his uh, support to the LGBTQ community, and it was it was really nice. I was up on the I had a view of the the grid almost right in front of where they were doing that we races one sort of moment or whatever they're calling it for this year. And when Vettel came out with that shirt on, that was just a, you know, just one where you sort of in in your own head, you sort of just silently go, yeah, good on you, Seb. That's that's nice to see. Um, the the problem wasn't that Vettel was wearing this shirt. I don't know whether it would have raised its own problem sort of in private, but the problem in this instance wasn't that shirt. It was the fact that when they did that moment and then switched to the national anthem, Seb didn't take it off, and night and I think it was. Bottas, Stroll and Signs didn't take off their GPDA We Race as One t-shirts either. And basically, ever since Lewis Hamilton wore the t-shirt about Breonna Taylor last year, the FA introduced these protocols that basically said, look, we want you to be able to do what you want in this moment, but we want the national anthem of the host country respected. So when you do that, and then when you finish the race and you go on the podium and all this we only want you to be in in, in team kit it was a roundabout way of blocking basically what what Hamilton had done Seb wasn't having any of that I they claim that all four drivers were apparently said by the stewards to have kept the shirt on because of the because it was raining or because it's like you know a bit more rain was imminent or, or whatever it was um, I suspect that might well have been the case for three of those four drivers but I'm I'm a hundred percent sure Vettel was wearing that shirt literally come rain or shine um but the point being that all four of them ended up reprimanded just simply because they were wearing shirts that wasn't team gear uh for for the national anthem so it that one really ended up as uh, as simple as that it, it wasn't just oh Vettel's wearing the color of the pride flag we need to punish him or, or something it, it wasn't quite like that always good to have some t-shirt related controversy to add to a, to a chaotic race. Uh, now, Mark, Alpha Tauri and Williams were actually the only two teams to get both cars home in the points. Gasly and Sonoda were sixth and seventh on the road. Nicholas Satifi and George Russell, eighth and ninth on the road, move them all up one place if and when the Vettel disqualification stands. How important was it for Williams in particular to bag those points? Oh, massively important. I mean, this is a uh sort of vindication of the, the the progress that they've made over the last few years, the last two years in particular. And um, it's, you know, they've deserved a, to be um, lower end point scorers on a few occasions now, and they've been unlucky that it hasn't um, hasn't come through. So, yeah, they maybe were a little bit lucky this time. And then that it, it, it came at one of their less competitive races. But uh, um, yeah, it's 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 sort of payback for the times when um, they were there on merit, but uh, didn't didn't get them. Yeah, it's quite funny that George Russell, having not made Q two for the first time, this is the day he scores points, and then of course he's behind Latifi because Latifi uh, got catapulted well up the order, but more even more up the order than Russell did by what happened at the uh, at the start. Obviously, great for Williams, but pretty bad news for Alfa Romeo. A big opportunity. For them now, if Fettel's excluded, Raikkonen will have scored one point, but actually Williams gained more, so that's even worse if they uh, get a point. Funnily enough, but their chances were really, really stymied during that format or end of the second formation lap, shall we call it, series of pit stop. Because first year Vinazzi, he was just a little bit too attacking coming into the pit lane. He got caught speeding. 
that led to a, a 10 second stop go penalty so that's one you have to say have to serve completely independently of a pit stop so that cast him off the back and he ended up spending the whole race trying to catch and then latterly pass Mick Schumacher's Haas which he was unable to do Kimi Raikkonen ended up getting a, a 10 second penalty for an unsafe release when he was released and, and hit Nikita Mazepin putting Mazepin's Haas out of the race Raikkonen actually that that was down to some kind of glitch with the system uh, Chevy Pujolar there their trackside engineering boss was saying that that the light basically went red green red and of course Raikkonen as he should do as soon as it went green went but it was just a, a some kind of glitch in the in the system. Uh, Pujola wouldn't really explain exactly what the what the problem was, but it led to to that happening. So although Raikkonen didn't have damage, that meant a penalty for him. And then Alfa Romeo ended up right down <laughs> down the bottom. So a big missed opportunity for them. We should perhaps also mention that in all this, Daniel Ricciardo finished twelfth or eleventh if. Uh, battle has gone in a, in a hobbled McLaren. Justin Kaufman from our, our members club actually asked a few excellent questions about Ricardo, but we're going to save those for one of our summer podcasts. There's actually plenty to talk about in response to them. So we wanted to have a little bit more time rather than giving the, the short version as we'd have to on this. But an absolutely amazing, amazing uh, race weekend. Brilliant to see Esteban Ocon winning, Fernando Alonso playing his part. Just a, a great storied weekend. Heading into the uh, the August break, let's just get a very quick, very quick summary. How good has this half season been so far, Scott? Uh, I think it's been amazing. I think it's been one of the it's been the best Formula One half Formula One season of the last few years. I think it's better than the uh, Ferrari uh, Mercedes fights of uh, seventeen eighteen. Um, just because I think there's a bit more dynamic to it. We've already got a. Uh, we've now got a, a lovely little shock result in the mix as well. I think the race by race narratives have generally been very, very good with a, the exception of probably of the, the two Austria races, really. That's the only time there wasn't anything that really sort of kept me hooked um, throughout. Uh, so I think um, I think it's a classic F1 season. And by, against all odds, we've found another way to, to make it even more intense this weekend so uh yeah this was a, this is a grand prix that will go down as one of the this will go down as one of if not the best grand prix of what will almost certainly be one of or if not the best f1 season yeah it's going to be those, one of those races is always talked about isn't it and like, this, this has been great hasn't it the, the tiny details that have led to the performance swings really close in the championship every time we thought there was kind of a a, a balance of power shift permanently it's shifted back for one reason or another Let's just hope this carries on for the second half of the season. Yeah, it'd be great. And it's um you know, there's no there's no second guessing it. There's no even even the, the, the teams themselves are unsure exactly where they're standing at the moment. And there's there's that element, there's also the element of Hamilton versus Verstappen, the, you know, the 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 what do you call it? The, the I guess it's just a battle of the generations, the turning of the tides, and it's and it's how uh, Hamilton is not uh, relinquishing that uh, ahead of the pride role, um, we you know easily if at all, and he's um, he's doing it with uh, full attack. He's not trying to do it in the way that um, perhaps previous champions have handled it when when a quicker younger guy has been coming up, they've accepted they're not as quick. Hamilton's not doing that. Hamilton's doing it. He's, he's taking it to him on performance. Um, so there's there's that. There's, there's just the fascination of how that's all playing out. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's an absolutely vintage season. And long may it continue. Thanks very much, Mark and Scott, for your insight. Do head to therace.com and don't forget the hyphen as there's vast amounts to read there, including my driver ratings, Mark Hughes' race analysis. And Scott is going to be explaining quite why Esteban Ocon's win was so popular with his rivals. So do check out the race's YouTube channel as well and try our sister podcasts, including Bring Back V10s, which tells classic F1 stories. The summer break is upon us, but the Race F1 podcast won't be stopping. So stay with us throughout August as there's plenty to talk about in this remarkable 2021 season.